Thanks for joining us for Tea and Trowels, the video series from the Florida Public Archaeology Network, where we talk with archaeologists about their research and what archaeology means to them. I'm Emily Jane Murray, one of your hosts, and today I'm joined by archaeologist Meg Gilliard, who works for the Heritage Trust Program for the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, and is also a co-founder of the South Carolina Public Archaeology Outreach Division. Hi, Meg. Thanks for joining us. Hey. Hey, Emily Jane. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Good. Um, would you like to say anything else about yourself and then tell us about your mug? Ah, yes. Yeah. So, um, like you said, I'm one of the co-founders of Scape Pod or the South Carolina Archaeology Public Outreach Division. It is a huge mouthful. And I'm also an archaeologist with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources Heritage Trust Program. Um, so those are kind of my two hats, uh, full-time archaeologist at DNR, and then my, my side gig, my nonprofit baby is, uh, is Skatepod. So we just hit our 10-year anniversary this year, so really fun. And then the mug I have brought is, I feel quite appropriate for the, uh, for the time. <laughs> so this is, um, this is folk art pottery from South Carolina, but its history is that it looks like or it is a face vessel. Um, so face jugs, face vessels, um, they have their history in the mid 1800s with enslaved potters in the Edgefield district of uh, South Carolina. And recently, um, or in more recent history, have become part of uh, folk art. So, so yeah, and I feel like his face is reminiscent of what we are all feeling on day 61 of quarantine. So, <laughs> so that's my mug. That I've is tea in my mug. So. That is a fantastic mug. I love to see when artists can like bring in, you know, history and archaeology into to like modern objects and real, you know, it, it, I think that's, it's a great way to bring that into our everyday lives. Um, I chose my Heritage Monitoring Scouts mug in honor of you. Um, this is the a citizen science project that FPN does that looks at uh, climate change impacts on archaeological site. And these are all things that you are also involved in public archaeology and citizen science and climate change impacts on archaeological sites. So felt like a good one. Very much so. <laughs> Um, well, we'll get started with our questions here. Why did you become an archaeologist? Okay, so when I was little, like when I was five, um, I used to want to be a paleontologist, and I'm sure a lot of archaeologists wanted to be paleontologists. So I had the dinosaur book bag, the dinosaur pencil box, and um, I was able to find, I've gotten rid of those things, but... In 1989, Crayola came out with movable dinosaur crayons, and I still have <laughs> a whole set of these things. Uh, so that's like circa 1989, Meg Gilliard's favorite things. So, um, so yeah, so I used to want to be a paleontologist, kept that dream alive for many years, and then in college, um, I was actually a journalism major and had an anthropology minor. And by about my sophomore year, realized I was taking far more anthropology courses and archaeology courses than I was journalism. They were starting to even out and was really enjoying them, doing well in them and thought, well, maybe I need to declare um, a double major. And then realized you can't do that at the University of South Carolina, which was where I was enrolled. I ended up having to declare a dual degree. So I have a degree in journalism with an English minor and then a degree in anthropology with an archeology span focus. And it was simply because I love both sides of those two degrees. So with journalism, you're telling the story of the now, the here and now, the people that are around you. And then with archeology, span you're telling the story of the people who came before us. Um, some who didn't write down their own history or were misrepresented. And so I felt like that kind of um, allowed me a perspective on the present and the past. Um, and so that's what kind of drew me to archaeology. Um, I like that. Um, I actually also studied uh, broadcast journalism in undergrad, and I never quite thought about the, the connection of, of storytelling that runs between the two of them. 
um, I, I didn't want to become a reporter. <laughs> That's right. I became an archaeologist, but <laughs> like, yeah, I was always more people. the photographer. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that that human story. I mean, I think that's what we're all after is is the truth behind the person, um, those individual lives, and how that makes a bigger story of humanity. Yeah. Well, can you tell us about your research? And the the trick is, we're giving you like thirty seconds. I guess we can all just call it a minute at this point because we're all <laughs> we it to keep it to thirty seconds, but. <laughs> Everybody's research is so dynamic and so, I mean, so wieldy. Over the course of years, you find your research just kind of grows in crazy directions. So, um, so my research, I kind of thought about this. I was like, gosh, I do so many weird little things. Um, but I guess the best way to encompass what I do is I really study the visual representation of archaeology. Um, and I've been doing that since I was an undergrad. And so that encompasses, you know, how we use photography and now photogrammetry in the field, how we use film, how we use audio and sound. And it's not only how we represent ourselves, but how do we as archaeologists want to be depicted? Um, what message are we sending out? Um, how do we control that message? And how do we allow other people to, to tell our story and to tell um, the story of pe the people and communities that we are researching um, in a visual and auditory sense. And so that's kind of the overarching uh, research that I do. But I also focus on disaster preparedness and recovery or heritage at risk um, with the sites that we're uh, losing to coastal erosion and climate change. Um, and then I also focus a lot with archaeology outreach and education, um, and that's K through 12 as well as adults. So in a nutshell, that kind of um, encapsulates um, my area of research and then most geographically specialized in South Carolina. Very cool. Yeah, I don't think a lot of archaeologists think about, um, okay, like the, how, you know, vision, like outreach it's it almost is as, as, as much of like how we represent ourselves you know telling about the sites and the people from the past are you know an important part of it you know but it also becomes like I joke that we do PR for Florida archaeology at, at FPAN you know because it's also like how do we represent ourselves to help and that gets wrapped up in like making the case for folks from the past and certainly yeah yeah, yeah definitely um, well, what are some of your favorite tools that you use in your research? <laughs> okay, so we like our stuff um, as archaeologists. We have a lot of tools, and, and uh, Emily Jane's been on our sites uh, for DNR, so you've seen all of our all of our toys. So <laughs> I don't have the backhoe here with me. So um, two of the tools. So I picked two. So two of the tools that represent me as an archaeologist the most are of course my camera. So um, I usually have a couple of cameras with me on site. So I have two here with me at my house now. Um, so I shoot with cannons. I've always shot with cannons. You'll have people who shoot Nikon or Canon. Um, so, uh, but I'm a Canon girl. And so I have a 60D um, with a 18 to 200 lens on this one right now. Um, and so that's my field camera. So I'll be shooting um, personnel shots as well as stratigraphic shots and things like that um, in the field. And then my most recent purchase is a um, EOS 60 Mark II, and it has an extra battery pack on the bottom so you can shoot it both ways. But this is an extremely high res camera. It shoots um, 4K video, um, and I'll use this for photogrammetry. So right now it has a set lens on it at 24 millimeters. Um, and so photogrammetry is another thing that I do in the field um, that you can see in our documentary films on our website. Um, but yeah, so cameras are a big um, tool that I use in the field. And then the other tool that we all have um, is a rucksack or a bag. So <laughs> we're always really um, specific about the type of bag you want. Mine is currently covered in pluff mud from an island. 
<laughs> I have not thrown it in the washing machine. Um, we were closing down a site right before uh, quarantine. But um, I picked up this bag in Ireland when I studied abroad in Galway um, over 15 years ago, and it has been on three continents with me. So it's really, really important to me. It holds my lunch, my med kit, my equipment, and it'll go anywhere with me. So, um, so those are the most important tools in my toolkit. A good bag is very important. And I always say the first rule of archaeology is you don't get separated from your lunch. So that is, is key to keeping your lunch close by. <laughs> right. Your lunch or your water. <laughs> always have carabiners on your bag to hold your water in place. Very cool. Do you have a best worst field story that you can now laugh about? Um, hmm. Okay. So um i thought of a whole bunch of stories and i can't laugh about a lot of them so <laughs> archaeology is a dangerous occupation <laughs> so um but two stories i can think about one's recent and one happened almost 10 years ago when i was in grad school in england so i'm sure a lot of people have been sharing field stories about horrible working conditions and bugs and animals and that kind of stuff. But one of the experiences I had was when I was in grad school in England. So my master's degree is in visual anthropology. And so I went to the University of Manchester for that. And we did a field project um, in grad school in England on an island called Alford Ness. It's a, a natural, uh, uh, what's it called, natural reserve, part of the natural national trust in England. And Alford Ness is, um, was, is mostly known for its ballistics training. Uh, radar was perfected there, perfected there, the parachute was perfected there. It was a bombing range. <laughs> Get where I'm going here. <laughs> so we were there for a whole weekend to to learn how to uh, record sound in varying conditions. Um, there are a lot of records have been lost about Alford Ness, um, and there are very weird structures still on the um, property that archeologically speaking would be very interesting to investigate. Um, you have to stick to trails because there's still unexploded ordnance on the entire island. Um, but the thing that kind of pushed me over the edge with that experience and the thing I'll never forget is we were about to have dinner, me and my cohort were about to have dinner, go in the bunk house and settle in for the evening. And the manager of the property asked us if we wanted to see the WE-177. It's like, well, what is this thing? Well, it's an atomic bomb. <laughs> that was in the bunkhouse next to us, um, it, de it was deactivated. But I have to say, out of all the crazy scenarios I've ever been in, even knowing that that atomic weapon was deactivated, I did not sleep at all that night, knowing that that was right next door to me. <laughs> and to this day, that is still the one thing I remember from any field experience I've ever had is sleeping next door to an atomic weapon. Yeah, that raises some interesting questions. <laughs> like if there's other unexplained ordinances that go off, could it then also make that one explode even if it's been deactivated? I told myself no, because I needed to sleep some. I just, <laughs> it, was, it is still to this day the most bizarre field experience I have ever had in my entire life. But it is very memorable. <laughs> Best in work. Yeah, that's and I can laugh about it now. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> um, well, here's our, our big juicy question. How do you think archaeology can save the world? I think the thing with archaeology is we have a really, uh, archaeologist across the board, we look at the forest and the trees. So we'll look at the broad span of time in terms of millennia. 
that's how we think of human history. But we are absolutely obsessed with the details of that history, down to the smallest pottery shirt, the fingernail imprint in the brick, the stratigraphy, every little minutia that we can absolutely investigate. And so I think the one thing that we can, you know, contribute to how we're going to help, you know, save the world is that kind of way of thinking about the world. Um, looking at the big picture and looking at the small details and taking it all in stride um, and always asking questions, even if you think you found the answer. Go back to your reports and rewrite them. <laughs> Go back to the collection, look at it again. So, so see, archaeology seems to be one of those things where for every one question you answer, there's like three more that arise in that process. So <laughs> always more to be found out. Very true. We're never finished. So. <laughs> Help. <laughs> <laughs> Well, our, our bonus question is, what's been keeping you sane during quarantine and social distancing? <laughs> um, so I've been doing a lot of gardening. So traditionally in May for the last few years, as some people may know, our team mobilizes for a massive excavation um, on Pocky Island in Edisto, South Carolina. And um, so this season, we weren't able to do that. Um, and so I was able to plant a garden, which I haven't been able to do in many years. So I've been gardening, um, cooking, um, taking my dog for many walks and runs. Um, and actually, one of the things that I've been doing was, uh, it's a little different than all that. Uh, during the 2015 flood, I learned that keeping a journal was really important because it keeps you um, sane from day to day. Um, there's a tendency within disaster scenarios to kind of blend days and weeks together. You kind of lose track of time really quickly. Um, and so I've been keeping a series of journals, just kind of writing down what I've been doing. And so I brought him five from my office and they vary in color scheme. So this one's already finished and filled up. So that was white. Now we're on the tan. Next is gonna be brown, then blue, and then we're, then we're in red if we hit day 250. So <laughs> that's how I'm keeping saying, we're on day 61 now. So <laughs> but keeping it orderly helps you, helps you stay sane. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I've, I've, I've definitely lost track of some days and time here. So now I know who to call when I need a reality check of where we are and all of this stuff. Just write it down. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us and uh, chatting with us on Tea and Trials. And thanks to everyone for watching along at home. Cheers. Bye, y'all.